This is the introduction to pottery for my middle schoolers in Mr. Kimball's class. It's the uh, ideas that you need to know and the methods behind clay working, and then you'll get some skill uh, instruction separate from this. So um, in ceramics, we often call it pottery. They really mean the same thing. Um, it's a lot of fun, but you need to do some experimentation and have some patience with yourself because not everything can be told to you. You do have to have some experience before you start to feel and understand maybe how much water, for example, is needs to be in your clay or how something will stay together and what will be stronger. And um, so take some notes and uh, these concepts will come up on a quiz before you can work with the clay so that I know you know the right terms and ideas. The first thing I want you to know about is a little bit of a history of kilns. Uh, what are they? Uh, they're, they're basically the big uh, ovens where we fire the clay and and in around 6000 BC, archaeologists have figured out or found um, uh, brick kilns above the ground. But before that, they had pits. And what, where, you know, how did they make these kilns above ground? They had probably figured out how to fire bricks, which are also made of clay, uh, in those pits uh, originally. So. These are older than, um, you know, over 8,000 years old, This these traditions of pottery. And artists still do use, um, uh, you know, wood-powered kilns today. Traditionally, uh, they, you know, they, they'll fire it with, with wood. But uh, the one on the right there, my kiln, is an electric kiln. And um, even at uh, North San Pete High School, they have a gas-powered kiln. Very much, they're more more efficient, and um, and we can regulate the temperature. Something that anciently they they had to learn how to regulate temperature with just a fire. But you can see that a kiln, when we fire things, we don't bake them. We fire them. Uh, they are uh, very important tools in in the clay making process or ceramic making process. Let's just go over four kinds of clay because you may use those or may not in your life uh, with other projects. So air dry clay is often made of glue, paper, and plant resin. Sometimes there are synthetic resin, resins in them. And air dry clay is really um, not as strong as some others, but it, you don't have to worry about baking it, maybe, but you can paint it when it's dry, and sometimes that might be a way for you to make sculptures or pots. Polymer clay is really um, a a man-made polymer, uh, polyvinyl chloride PVC. You may have heard of PVC pipes. It is a polymer, and it so it was man-made, but it has to be baked say in an oven so maybe you don't have a kiln at home and you really want to try something and this this kind of pvc uh, sculpture would be really a lot stronger than say an air dry clay um, oil based clay is not used for pottery uh, but it is used for sculpting and you would use it uh, maybe to make a sculpture that you would create a mold for and then later on you would bronze it or cast it in some other kind of material, resin. Um, then you could you re you reuse the oil-based clay. Water-based clay is what we're using for uh, pottery and, and uh, ceramics. There's earthenware, which is very porous, often a lot of sand and other things in it. Uh, terracotta, if you've heard of the terracotta warriors in China, uh, they're, they're life-size statue warriors that were unearthed who are defending a king. <clears throat> and then there's, uh, you know, it's not as strong uh, of a clay, but it is 
it is interesting and beautiful. Uh, there's also stoneware, which we are using in our classes. Stoneware is uh, mined from often river beds or old lake beds. And then there's um, clay that's porcelain, which is a finer refined clay um, also found in uh, old deposits of uh, rivers and geologically. Um, it's a very, uh, China began uh, the, the porcelain trade anciently, and it is a very refined and white uh, clay, very nice to work with. Uh, we won't be working with porcelain, it's expensive, but stoneware we will be. <clears throat> the next one is wedging and moisture. When we're talking about clay that's been milled from the earth, it's often ground into a powder and then processed and mixed with water to get the right consistency in a pug mill. This picture is of a, of a pug mill. And, <coughs> excuse me, and the pug mill um, is a great big, um, it's like a, a beater or, or a uh, mixing machine. The clay needs to be, um, even when we get it in bags, we need to kind of get those molecules um, bonding. And so we, we want to also wedge out by pushing on the clay, by smashing it and, and working it a little bit. Get the air bubbles out of the clay and possibly add more water. Um, but there has to be a balance of moisture. So clay that is too wet will be too slimy and our object can't, won't hold its shape and uh, clay can get worn out so we'll let it sit uh, if we have to and we'll get a new piece of clay and uh, it can be too dry and, and we can't work it and it, it starts to crack and create fissures. So we have to have a correct balance of water in the clay so we wedge it with our hands. I would compare it a lot to kneading uh, bread dough when you have to mix the bread dough and you have to knead it and and smash it and uh, uh, so wedging becomes a very important part of it you'll see this in another video the skills portion of the of the uh, of can canvas here are three hand building processes that we use in ceramics uh, the first one on the left pinch pots those two pots on the left are formed by creating a ball of clay, sticking a, your thumb into the middle of the clay, and then as you rotate the clay in your hand in a circle, much like a potter's wheel, as you rotate that clay, you're pinching it, and you're working from the bottom of that pot, and then pinching it up higher and higher. You're trying to create a uniform wall. Uh, the thickness sh should be pretty uniform and consistent. It's basically pinching as a method to make something. So that's one thing that I'll demonstrate in another video. Another one is slab building. So you're going to roll out clay, cut it into shapes, bond it at the corners, and build it as a structure. And there's a certain way you have to build these. So slab building is using rolled out flat clay. The next one is coil pots. And coil pots are made by, and this is these are all ancient, uh, you know, old methods of hand building ceramics. But you're basically um, going back in history, make remaking the same things that possibly your ancestors did. Coil pots, they're r rolled out like snakes, and uh, then you're attaching those coils together, whether they're in loops or whether they're in in uh, hoops that you um, basically bond together in and stack it up. So those are the handmade techniques that I want to introduce to you. Now when we bond two pieces of clay together we're going to call it scratch and slip from now on. So you can see if I wanted two things to go together in this left picture I would scratch it with a needle and rough up the clay so that I can get some slip in between those cracks and then and then bond the two together like cement 
that slip is in that right hand picture it's liquefied clay essentially it's very wet and slimy and it acts like a mortar so it's not glue it's just um really wet clay that will will keep those two together when it when it dries so uh you also need to possibly if you if you're worried about the seam uh smooth out the seam using a tool like a a little wooden um you know round tool to to uh, smooth it out but that will also come in a skill demonstration everything that needs to be attached uh, or clay that needs to be attached to something else needs to be scratched and slipped because the molecules in two pieces of clay aren't necessarily joined because they're mo they're moving in different directions and they need to be bound by something that will attach them and that's why we began wedging in the first place but now scratching and slipping what can also substitute for that let's talk about a few principles and elements in pottery um, because you'll want to use some of these um, balance is literally and figuratively part of pottery uh, naturally most of what we make is symmetrical it's uh, the same on one side as the other or it it tends to be round because that's a process. Spinning is a process with pottery. Your creation should stand, be able to stand on their own. Um, they shouldn't be unbalanced by adding clay to one side or another. It could overload a side if you have too many things. So you think about the handles and you think about the spouts on something or you think about if uh, you make a pinch pot and you want to turn it over and turn it into a turtle, if you give it a head and some legs, what, can you turn it back over and expect it to stand on its own? Or does it need a foot? Um, those are things that we can talk about in the future videos. Um, but balance is also, you know, are your patterns showing up on one side but not the other? Are, are there colors or heavy um, elements on one side that you don't have on the other or uh, you know figuratively like uh, maybe you you etch or you carve a picture on one side and a design but the other side is just flat what will you do with that space um, how it looks and how it will come across is always something we talk about in art the next one repetition you want to have a stamp Possibly in my classroom, I have stamps of designs like you see on the red uh, slab pot there. But there's also um, objects you can find, like uh, even a simple thing like a plastic fork that you can press a uh, little texture or divots into it or create squares. Or there's needles that you can scratch in. And um, texture is the next one, so be creative with things that you find that can alter your surface. Maybe you have something lying around that you're welcome to bring to class to stamp it and or or create a texture with. Color is the last one. Use color theory that you know, but be aware that when we color these ceramics after they've been fired the first time, you can't always mix two uh, glazes is what we call them. You can't mix two colors and expect you know that blue mixed with a yellow glaze would come out, come out green. Um, but it would be a good idea to maybe put blue and green together, and sometimes you can experiment with these glazes and swirl them and combine them. Um, but it's always a good idea to remember color theory that, that some of the, you know, if you want a couple colors together, two or three colors, that you remember the color schemes we've learned about, Maybe you've, you're going to use complementary colors. You know, you've got a blue and an orange, a purple and a yellow together. Maybe you look at a triad of colors. Uh, they would always, um, you know, and you can mute them. You know, ceramics are often known for their very earthy colors. and um, But that, again, will come with experimenting and experience. Uh, I want to talk about sculpting for just a minute because in clay work we do a lot of adding clay and, and building up clay, but you can also use a subtractive process like 
if you had a piece of stone that you were chiseling, stone is always subtractive because you always have to take away from the stone to reveal an image that you want to create. So that's fun, but it also can work in in clay work where you maybe you want to create an architectural feel and you don't want to scratch and slip too much, so you're going to start digging into the clay instead of um, forming the clay outward. And that subtract the idea of subtractive sculpting is very much a, a real part of, of sculpture in pottery. Um, I'm just going to introduce the idea of throwing a pot on a wheel. You're going to, and those of you who will be using a pottery wheel in my classes will find that there are more steps in this, but I just wanted to give you an idea that a potter's wheel comes with a lot of um, patience uh, that you practice and that you you learn how to do certain things. So one of the first things that's the most challenging is just getting the clay to stay in the center of this spinning wheel. Now, just like a pinch pot when you were hand building with clay, this is spinning for you instead of you spinning it in your hands. And you have to keep your hands in one place and hope that if it's lo not lopsided, you know, um, that you can keep forming it and pushing on it until it moves up off the surface of the wheel. That's really what's happening is you're creating pressure until it moves up um, and possibly out and that you're keeping the thickness uniform throughout. It's a challenge. Um, number two, they're coning it and and um, is part of centering, really. You just you're pushing the clay to create a cone and keep it centered so it doesn't get lopsided, and then you have to smash it back down. That is essentially how you wedge clay while it's on the wheel, and, um, and then you can start pulling or throwing the pot. They're just figures of speech. You don't actually have to throw this anywhere, but you're pulling or throwing it into shape. Um, that's essentially the process, but there's more to it, so that would come in another skills video. Now, the terms for the stages of clay are um, important because we have to refer to these, especially when you get graded. So, in my class, before you put your pots in the kiln, or before I put the pots in the kiln, the clay needs to be dried it may take a week or two before I can get them in the kiln because they some things really have to take longer drying. It has to be what we call bone dry. It's so dry that there's as little moisture as possible in the clay. So at this stage, it's, it's uh, extremely fragile. It's breakable. I'm going to ask you now to not touch other people's projects because it just um you possibly could ding it and it would just chip or something could fall off. At this stage we also find out whether your scratch and slip method was good because when you scratched and slipped a handle onto something when it dries if you didn't truly do it that's when the molecules won't hold together and it just falls right apart. So um I'm going to grade you at this stage uh, you'll take a picture when it's greenware and submit that on Canvas so I can give you a, your first grade on this project. Now, other things happen in the kiln um, other than things maybe possibly um, drying and falling off. But when it gets to the kiln, it will, uh, it will be heated, right? So it will be up to somewhere around 1,500 degrees and... If there are air bubbles in the clay or if there's moisture in the clay, something I didn't talk about earlier, then the heat differential between the kiln and the insides of the clay could actually explode or crack your pottery. So I don't want there to be any water in it and I don't want there to be any air bubbles in it, but I can't control the air bubbles uh, if there's something in there that you didn't get out when you were wedging. Um, so I want to give you the grade before it, it gets fired because that shows, you know, the, that you tried. And e 
later one of your projects will make it out of the kiln at least a couple of them will make it out of the kiln and we can give you a grade for glazing later um, but if it made it out in one piece or even if you like it uh, still if something broke but we can still glaze it we will do that so greenware is that stage just before going into the kiln now after it's been taken out of the kiln and it's cooled off takes a couple days for everything to get fired warmed up and then cooled down uh, this is bisque wear. now bisque wear is the stage now where it the clay has been crystallized it's been fired and it's pretty strong it's a lot stronger than when it was greenware um, but it still could uh, break anciently when they came up with bisque ware out of a fire pit or out of a kiln they were really happy to have this object that they could now use for storing food or eating food or drinking um, what they found out is that bisque ware will absorb water and it'll absorb oils and those oils and water um, they weaken the bisque ware so it's still not protected it's not waterproof it needs to be sealed somehow and that will bring us to the next concept of glazeware when it when your bisque ware is coated with a uh, uh, glaze it it is glaze is a silica um, made of silica silica is sand right um, glass they figured out anciently again that that glass could be made from silica from sand and there's other things added to it um, a few minerals that allow it to stay on the ceramics while we're firing it and glazeware can be colored so uh, we'll paint we'll paint different colors on or sometimes we dip it in glaze and um, one thing you'll need to remember we'll see in the video is that that we can't have glaze on the bottom of the the thing the thing sometimes we can there are tricks to do it but generally speaking i don't want to have glaze on the bottom of your project we can wipe it off because it'll stick it'll melt to the kiln and then i have to break it off and grind it off um, so we're going to be careful when we glaze that'll come again in our skills portion now i want to teach you some more things about using clay that will help you with projects in my uh, classes in eighth grade we are using um, uh, molds plaster molds and we're using lots of slip so remember slip is liquefied clay you'll make your own slip and you get to pour it into plaster molds let it sit for a little while and then pour it back out plaster has this great quality of absorbing water and as soon as it starts absorbing water the glaze or the clay sticks to the sides of that that uh, plaster you can see on the right that's wet um, that's wet clay that the water's been soaked uh, into the plaster and then we pulled it open and it's now it's still very soft clay but it's stuck to them to the plaster and we we're able to just pull it off and and uh, make some really cool things out of that um, there are other molds that you could make especially if they're just uh, you don't need two sides to the mold so I have before used uh, an, a, an existing plate that I want to press a slab over and then just cut it with a needle and then make my own plate in in the same form or we have molds of faces that you can make a mask from and you press it in and then you can shape the features uh, molds are also made if you want to uh, find an object uh, you can possibly pour plaster over an object and then when the plaster dries pull that object out as long as there's no undercuts or holes in it that will you know keep it from coming out of the plaster you can also carve the plaster a little bit but then you can keep that plaster and pour slip in or 
push clay into it and then pull it back out and you've got that shape. It's always fun to create sculptural items out of, uh, th out of these things. So um, think about molds and think about how clay could replicate other things. Okay, that is all for the terms that I want you to know about in, um, in pottery and ceramics.